Okay, welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, this is the second episode of the second season of the Late Night Conference. My name is Wilhelm Huck and I'm your host tonight. Uh, I'm very excited. Actually, I'm a bit overexcited because having a live audience here is uh, also new for us. And it's actually more nerve wracking to get everything right with all the people watching right away than it is when it is only uh, via YouTube. Uh, but also if you're watching at home, welcome uh, to uh, the show tonight. So, um, last week, we uh, started the season on artificial life uh, with Hans Klevers talking about organoids and uh, synthetic tissue, essentially. This week, we are going, last month, I mean, sorry. Um, this week, we are going to zoom in to the level of individual cells. And you would say, well, imagine that you can synthesize a genome, not just a piece of DNA or a gene or a plasmid, but a whole genome containing all the genes that are necessary for a minimal form of life. And then you take this genome and you transplant it into a cell and you make that genome come to expression and the cell is slowly being taken over by that new genome that is being active. And then when the cell divides, you have a complete minimal living cell from a designed piece of genome. Well, that is exactly what today's speaker actually and his team actually did. And I think this is a series of experiments that is probably the most, one of the most beautiful uh, experiments that science had ever, has ever produced. And so the speaker of today I'm talking about is Professor John Glass, who is the head of um, the, uh, Craig Van the synthetic biology group at the Craig Venter Institute in La Jolla near San Diego. And uh, he is, has trained as a biologist and then did a PhD in genetics, uh, but then uh, he started his academic career in the early 90s at the University of Alabama, already starting to look at mycoplasma biology or mycoplasma you'll hear more about today. Then after a while, he actually left academia. He spent five years from 1998 uh, onwards at uh, Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Company looking at uh, infectious diseases. And then in 2003, he uh, uh, joined the Craig Venter Institute where he did a remarkable uh, series of experiments that hopefully he's going to talk to us about today. So I'm very much looking forward to John's talk. Um, of course, as always, uh, if you're in the uh, uh, YouTube, please put your uh, questions in the chat. Otherwise, we'll have a lively discussion uh, afterwards here with the audience. Uh, and with that, um, John, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Wilhelm. It is an honor to almost be in the Netherlands. I feel like I've got at least, you know, one foot there. Uh, it's a cold day here in San Diego, 27 degrees. Uh, but I understand, you know, Wilhelm said it was it was warming up there. So I realize I'm not talking to an audience of synthetic biologists. So I'm going to present this in a sort of John Glass centric way as to how I got to be here and how my history in science enabled us to facilitated this creation of life from non-living parts. And so like so many scientists of my age, I wanted to be Mr. Spock. I hope you know that means something in the Netherlands. It certainly would here among my friends and you know, fellow, fellow geeks. But I grew up in the American South where to sound Southern was to be ignorant there in North Carolina. And as a kid, what I wanted to do was to be a scientist. And I tried to be a human encyclopedia of scientific facts. And so I read all of these books and I committed them to memory. And you know, I could go out walking in the woods and I could tell you what every tree was and what the rocks were. And I could point at the stars and say that this is Cassiopeia and so on. But I didn't really understand what it meant to be a scientist because Objective facts are wonderful and they give you insight into the world, but science is a process for discovery of objective facts, not the encyclopedia. And so I feel like as a child, at least in my pre-university and university life, it failed me because it taught me facts rather than how to do science. 
And it wasn't until, even though I was a terrible undergraduate student at the University of North Carolina, somehow I was accepted into graduate school and I joined the microbiology department to become a virologist. And that's where I learned to become a scientist although it took me nine years to get through graduate school. And so this was with an RNA virus, much like you know a, a similar virus to the one that we are struggling with today. And then I did a two year postdoctoral fellowship with another virus called polio. First was vesicular stomatitis virus, which is a cattle virus, a model virus. But my second postdoctoral fellowship was working in bacterial genomics and microbial pathogenesis. And this is when I began thinking about minimal cells and I was working daily with mycoplasmas, which are this group of atypical bacteria that are so critical for what we have been doing. And so there was a pause in my academic career. I spent five years in the pharmaceutical industry and actually at Eli Lilly and Company, I, you know, I was part of the team that developed the first anti-HCV drug as well as a broad spectrum antibiotic. And a lot of my friends in the pharmaceutical industry who have still been in there 20 years haven't gotten one drug yet. So I was very proud of that. But I joined Lilly. So the day after I got promoted, HR called my whole department in and said, you're all being let go, which was a little bit disturbing, but I found myself looking at a job ad from the Venter Institute about building synthetic life and this idea of life by synthetic design. So I went and interviewed at the Venter Institute and I interviewed with my heroes, Hamilton Smith, Nobel laureate, discovered restriction enzymes, a remarkable, remarkable man. He retired at 93 a year ago from the Venter Institute and strangely, ridiculously, it seems, for the last few years, I've been his supervisor, which I thought was sort of silly. Craig Venter, a remarkable man. Don't assume he's just a manager. He is a scientific savant with brilliant ideas. And then I still work with Clyde Hutchison, who is, you know, one of my senior 83-year-old postdocs, who is another guy twice on the last guy knocked off a list of Nobel Prize winners for a remarkable career in, in genetics. But these are the guys that I worked with. And I joined the Venter Institute first in Rockville, Maryland for uh, 11 years. And the last eight years, I've been at our institute in La Jolla, the world's first fully green scientific building. Uh, but, you know, what I was there for was, you know, we joked about it, it was to play God. Here's a picture of Craig. Uh, on Newsweek Europe, but you know, really what it was about was enabling genetic manipulation of untractable microbes by cloning genomes and yeast, which is of course is, is not quite as sexy as playing God, but you know, it's still our efforts to make a bacterial cell from non-living parts got a lot of attention in the world. But before we get to that, I'm gonna go into some of the other things that I got to spend time on in my 18 years at the Venter Institute. And so one of them was influenza vaccine improvement. Now for the last 70 years, actually, the pharmaceutical industry is in an annual race to produce a vaccine against influenza virus. So it involves surveillance to see where there are new strains of influenza strain selection, and then six months for, for manufacturing and production. And the problem with this six month is, is often, as you see in this, let me get there, in this diagram. So this is in 2009, this was the pathway of the pandemic for H1, H, H1N1. And by the time that a vaccine was available, the pandemic was almost done. And so here's the production rate of vaccine. The process was just too slow. And the first step in this process has always taken about a month. And this is where they take virus from patients in China or Indonesia, and they ship this to labs around the world who will 
produce this virus and then mate this virus with a virus that has been adapted for growth in chicken eggs. And so what they're trying to do is get a, a chimeric virus that has two genes from the patient snot sample and the remaining genes from this strain that has been adapted for growth in chicken eggs. And so this is about 35 days at the beginning of the influenza virus process. And so what we worked out and others is that you sequence the genome of the patient sample in Indonesia and you do it in Indonesia and you digitally transfer that information to labs, you know, to other labs who will synthesize copies of the influenza genes in expression systems. And these will then be transformed into mammalian cells so that in three days, you get in essence, the first dose of a vaccine emerging from those cells. And so, you know, the idea is that the old process was 35 days and we've now got it to five to seven days. And in fact, in 2013, the Chinese announced the sequence of the H7N9 strain of influenza that was killing hundreds of thousands of pigs and a bunch of pig farmers in China. And there was worldwide concern that this would be the onset of a new influenza pandemic. And so there was urgent need for a vaccine. And they announced this sequence on Easter Sunday. And by the end of the day on Easter Monday, we had synthesized the whole genome from digital information and had it on a plane to our collaborators from, from California to our collaborators in Boston, who produced the first dose of the vaccine by, by the Friday after, you know, five days after we received the sequence information. So we thought that this was a real victory, but these were the same methods that we used that were developed to build synthetic cells. Other things that were, I was a part of at the Venter Institute. So Craig, uh, emulating his, his uh, one of his heroes, Charles Darwin, decided to launch the Global Ocean Sampling Expedition. And he bought a 100-foot yacht and outfitted it to be sort of a research vessel. And they went around the world sampling water every 200 miles. So they would take seawater and filter out. First, they filter out the fish and the jellyfish and stuff. But then they would filter out the microbes send those samples back to the Venter Institute labs, and we generated digital information about the microbes that were in the water. And we found just an extraordinary diversity, much more diversity of bacteria in the ocean than was expected. And the databases just exploded with this. And while we didn't patent any of this information and all of it was publicly available, we did use it to produce marine cyanobacteria that could produce hydrogen photosynthetically under aerobic conditions. Um, none of these were really suitable for energy production, but, but this was something that we worked on for many years and Craig later moved this to one of his companies. But what I wanna talk about now is getting back to this idea of playing God or building building an organism from scratch that Wilhelm talked about. And so, first of all, what we really pioneered was the capacity to synthesize huge pieces of synthetic DNA from four bottles of chemicals. And the idea here is that what we wanted to do, you know, the thing that was driving this, Craig had had since he was in graduate school and maybe science has had this ambition for you know almost a hundred years now is to really understand what life is and in the 1930s there was a group of scientists led by max delbrook but it included erwin schrodinger and a lot of famous biologists and physicists who talked about this idea of what is life and they wish they could have had a minimal cell. 
because what they wanted was something that was so simple that it would be easy to understand. And so what we thought we would do starting really in the early 1990s, but it really didn't get going. We spent almost 20 years developing the tools we needed to answer this question and build this idea of a minimal bacterial cell to study the first principles of life. So what we wanted to ultimately learn is what genes are necessary for life using the lens of genomics or what are the tasks a living cell must perform. And so we wanted to build a minimal bacterial cell, a cell that had just the absolute minimum number of parts. And what we were thinking is that physicists and chemists in the 19th and 20th century used the hydrogen atom to understand the first principles of how, how matter works. And they used the hydrogen atom because it was the simplest possible thing to work with. And they reasoned that the physical forces that govern the hydrogen atom would govern more complex systems. And this same reductionist thinking has permeated science for, for more than a century. And so early molecular biologists had bacterial viruses called phage. So they used this system called Phyx-174 that only had 11 genes. And they figured out what this did. And in fact, one of my you know, current employees, my 83-year-old postdoc, Clyde Hutchison, he did a lot of this original work in graduate school at Caltech in the in the 50s, I mean, in the 50s and 60s. And microbiologists also, so a vast amount of work has been done with E. coli, but there are, E. coli has 4,000 genes and microbiologists have thought if we could study simpler organisms, it would be great. And so the simplest organism that we know of in nature is called Mycoplasma genitalia. And it only has a small number of genes and mycoplasmas are atypical bacteria. They are not like other bacteria, but we thought that we are gonna use mycoplasmas and we are gonna build the hydrogen atom of biology. And so here's a scanning electron micrograph of a cell we built. Now, why do we want a minimal cell? Well, the idea is what a minimal cell is, is a cell that contains only the essential genes needed for independent life under ideal lab conditions. And you can't take away a single gene without a loss of viability. And so the idea is that if it has all the machinery needed for cellular life, then if we know the function of every gene, it may be possible to really understand what it means to be alive. And so as a way we'll do that is we will make computer models to see if our computer models that take into account every gene, every atom in a cell, if they are detailed enough and accurate enough, we will really understand what life is and we can predict the effects of environmental variations on this cell and eventually move to more complicated organisms and solve real human problems in research, industry, medicine, the environment, et cetera. So that was the grand plan. Now, of course, there are bacteria in nature like Mycoplasma genitalia. It takes six weeks to do an experiment. So we decided we wanted a cell that would grow fast. It would divide every two hours and no gene could be removed without radically slowing the growth rate. And what we came up with was this organism called Mycoplasma mycoides, which is similar to things like the organism that causes uh, streptococcus pneumoniae or streptococcus pyogenes strep throat. It's a bacterium, but you can see here that it's much smaller even than an E. coli cell. It's just a little bit bigger than a virus. It normally infects goats. It's a mild pathogen, but it's already much smaller than E. coli. E. coli with 4,000 genes, our organism has just a little less than you know, 900 genes. It has minimal metabolic complexity. It doesn't make anything but more cells. It does produce these beautiful fried egg-like colonies in a couple of days. Now we put a gene in so it would interact with a chemical 
to make a blue yolk sort of on the fried egg colony, but it makes these colonies in two to three days. So you can do good experiments. And to make our cell, we had to develop three technologies that didn't exist. So when we started this in 1993, really in earnest, and that's when I joined the Venter Institute, the largest gene that had ever been, the largest piece of DNA that had ever been synthesized was 35,000 base pairs. And it took the group that did it years. So we knew we had to develop a method that would do this much, much faster. And we started by having chemical synthesis of 60 base oligonucleotides. And we would build these using enzymes in vitro into larger and larger pieces. And eventually we would make a genome that we would put a small piece of yeast DNA in it so that it could be cloned as a yeast artificial chromosome. This way we can park this genome and grow huge amounts of it so that we can then isolate it, somehow install it using a process we developed called genome transplantation into a suitable recipient cell to produce a synthetic cell with the genotype, meaning the DNA sequence, and all of the physical characteristics of, that were encoded in this genome. And so we did this, we published this paper in Science in 2010. Here's some electron, some scanning electron micrographs of the cell. These are like 400 nanometer spheres and we called this organism JCDI SYN 1.0. Now, right after we did this, we immediately start into trying to minimize the genome. And so we had to identify, so there were efforts ongoing to minimize E. coli where they would whittle a few genes away at a time. But what we wanted to do was discover what all of the essential genes were and all of the non-essential genes. And then just in one step, design and build a genome that had only the essential genes. And then using this process, our design build test cycle. We would design a genome, build it, test it using this genome transplantation process. And after a few years, we got this to work in 2010 for the, the wild type genome and in 2016 for the minimal cell. And so, and just to make it clear, while the mycoplasmas are already near minimal, so in this map of M. genitalium biology, a whole lot of what is in these organisms is probably, it's all necessary for life in the organism it infects, a human urogenital system, a goat respiratory system, but lots of genes, about a quarter, if not half of the genes are not necessary for life in, a, in the laboratory. And so we designed a minimized version of the mycoplasma of the mycoplasma mycoides genome that only had about half the number of genes. And we did all the experiments, we synthesized the genome. You know, it took some trial and error, but we booted this up and published on it in 2016. And let's see. And so, oops. So here's the scanning electron micrograph. But in 2016, my team got out of the synthetic biology tool business and we got into the gene to the business of analyzing the cell because we wanted to use this to understand what the first principles of cellular life were. And so here's how I want you to think of our cell. Not as that thing you saw in the electron micrograph, but as this salad in art by Swedish artist Urs Welderus. And so imagine this is the salad. This is, this is how we want you to view it. And so we realized that of the genes that were left in the minimal cell, about half of them are for expression and preservation of, gen of information. So how to use DNA to make RNA to make proteins. Now, another 20%, you know, a little less, of the genome, we had no idea what it did. And then the rest was cytoplasmic glycolysis, et cetera. Now bear with me on this because this is an important slide. This was 
one of the most remarkable findings we got. So look here and what you see is each line up here corresponds to a different genome from some bacteria. And we compared each gene in the minimal cell with the genes in these bacteria or humans or plants, Arabidopsis, humans, fruit flies, uh, yeast, et cetera. We compared the genes. If there was a similar gene in humans in humans, or, or here, let's, let's say. So if there's a similar gene in E. coli, then we put a colored bar for that gene. And these genes are arranged in how well we understand what they do. So if the minimal cell has 439 protein coding genes, so about half of them are equivalogs. We really know what those genes, what the proteins made by these genes do. And most of these are broadly conserved in all biology. And this is a really stringent test. If we loosen this up a little bit, this would just be completely colored. Now, another quarter of the genes, or maybe you know, a little less than that, a quarter of the genes, we've got a pretty good idea what they do. And again, these are probably something that we know about or putatively something we know about. And as you can see, most of these genes are still conserved. But what stunned us, what we just found almost hard to believe is that the functions of a third of the genes in this organism, after you know a hundred years of biological research, we had no idea what these things did. And a whole lot of these genes are present in everything from you and me to plants to all bacteria. And so what we have been focusing on the last six years is trying, we and others have been trying to figure out what these genes do. And so now we've gone from 149 to 93 genes, which we think is great. Now, one of the other amazing things about publishing this paper in 2016 is within days of publishing this paper, scientists all over the world started writing me. I was, I guess, the contact person for this, writing me saying that they read our paper and they want to use our cell and they want to work with us to understand the first principles of biology. And so now, six years later, we have this growing international movement that includes Wilhelm Huck, who introduced me a little while ago. And in fact, several labs in the Netherlands and in Europe and China and Australia, it's all over the world. There are more than 50 labs now using the cell, industrial, academic, do-it-yourself biology labs that are using the minimal cell to both for applied purposes, but also to understand what life is. And so I'm going to give you a couple of vignettes, the things that I think are the coolest that we worked on, especially this thing where we talked about minimal cell morphology and giant cells. So eight years ago, I started working with an MIT physics graduate student and a physicist at the United States Institute of Standards and Technology. So James Pelletier and Elizabeth Strahovski. And these were both physicists and they were trying to help me develop a more automated way to do this genome transplantation technology. And when we built the minimal cell, I gave it to them to look at in these microfluidic systems that they were developing. Now, here's sort of the punchline of what they found. They didn't see this at the time, but they saw evidence that showed us this. If this was the wild type micro, mycoplasmal mycoides, JCVI sin 1.0, 400 nanometer spheres, very uniform. And this is the minimal cell. These two electron micrographs, this organism has half the genes that this does, are at the same magnification. Now, I hadn't seen this when Elizabeth and James showed me their system. So they have built this system that uses tiny chambers built called microfluidic devices 
where they can flow, um, they can flow liquid containing micro or, or growth media containing microbial cells through this channel. And a few cells work their way into these microfluidic chambers where they continue to grow. And they can monitor this using, uh, using microscopy, video microscopy over you know, a, a day. And so first they looked at wild type minimals, I mean, wild type cells. And this is exactly what we expected. So this is direct optics, or here's where the cells are labeled with a fluorescent protein. And these dots that you're seeing are about 400 nanometer spheres. And this is exactly what cells we expected. So, you know, think about you've got a cell and it keeps accumulating material and it forms a barrier between the two daughter cells and somehow it divides. This is how modern cells work. Now, James and Elizabeth showed me this video. And this is a video of the minimal cell. And so this is, this is the greatest moment in my scientific life. So you come in in the morning expecting to see what you were expecting to see, a cell that divides. You expected it to be like a normal cell. But instead, you start with one cell in this chamber, and it doesn't divide. It makes a string of spaghetti that just grows and fills up the chamber. And the chamber, these strings of spaghetti are full of hundreds of copies of the bacterial genome. This was just wildly different than what I was expecting. And you live for moments like this as a scientist, when something is so different than what you would expect. In an instant, it changed how I viewed life. And I realized that what we have done, while it's not a primitive bacterial cell, we may have recapitulated what life looked like before cell division, modern cell division evolved. And basically every cell on earth uses that we know of today, except this cell uses a process that looks pretty much the same in my cells and plant cells and bacteria, you name it. It is this cell division process of forming a wall between the two daughter cells and the genomes separate into the two daughter cells and the cells go their separate ways or they make a human or whatever. And so we were just stunned here, as I said, you know, if you go back, uh, you know, these two cells, I mean, these two images, electron micrographs of, of our cells are of the same magnification means in one area of the bacterial chromosome. And it turns out that this mutant called JCVI sin 3 a with the 19 additional genes look like a normal cell. I'm almost done here and we can talk. And what we were stunned to find is that it had these two genes involved in protein, I mean, in cell division. And we said, aha, it makes perfect sense. FTSZ and CEPF. If we add these back to the minimal cell, it'll divide like a normal cell. This is the scientific method at its best. We did that and it didn't make any difference at all. We were stunned to find that we didn't have to add those genes. We had to add seven genes, including five genes that we had no idea what they did. And only when you added all five of those, all seven of those genes at the same time, did you get a cell that divided like a normal bacterial cell. And so this we're now pursuing as we are investigating how cell division evolved. And you know, it's great to publish because we got email. Elizabeth Strahowski got email from these two Polish paleobiologists. And they said, you know, congratulations on your article. We defined that we found that your minimal cell is similar, if not identical, to the pattern of cell divisions we identify on microbes, fossilized microbes 
that are 3.4 billion years old. And they sent us these images. Here's, here's their, our cell, and here's their cell. And they think they look the same. But we were stunned by this. And we're working with these guys you know, to try to understand this remarkable process that is so critical to how cells function. And again, we're seeing genes that are not sufficient for cell division, but genes that are widely conserved in you, me, bacteria, plants, that we have no idea what they're doing in the replication of cells. We also have built a computational model of the minimal cell. And this, it's an ideal thing because simpler is easier and you can do a better job. And so for instance, in the model that takes into account every protein that we know what it does in the cell, it accurately reproduces aspects of what minimal cell biology is. And so for instance, we know that there's not a transaldolase, a TAL protein. There's nothing that looks like it in the minimal cell, but we believe that some gene has to do this. And so now for instance, for the cell to divide in two hours instead of eight, it has to have a transaldolase. And so we're now trying to figure this out and lots of other questions about the cell. And it's an ongoing process that we've got a large consortium of laboratories working on to try to understand what life is. Uh, and so with that, you know, I'll say that you know, this work, it's a tool to investigate first principles of cellular life. Our vision is if we know where every cell, you know, what every cell does, what its functions, the roles of every gene product, we can build algorithms on a grand scale to build organisms. You know, this will allow us to make organisms to solve human problems. But there's also, you know, we need to think about the ethical aspects of this. And so when we published on this in 2010, from 2003 to 2010, I went to many, as many conferences about the ethics of synthetic biology, synthesizing DNA, making organisms, as I did about the science. And these conferences identified these societal concerns, like bioterrorism, can people build dangerous organisms or viruses, laboratory safety, harm to the environment, distribution of benefits to all of society and other ethical and religious concerns. And so we engage stakeholder communities and we've written reports and we're trying really hard to make the public understand that we are very aware of these dangers. Uh, with that, I'm gonna stop and hopefully I can take some questions. I will say that you know, this is not just my work. This is a large group of people that I'm working directly with and an even larger group of people that I don't work directly with. But at this point, I think I'm gonna stop and we're gonna have some conversations, which I'm really looking forward to this. So let's see. Well, thank you, John. That is a, a wonderful oh, presentation. I so thank you for uh, sharing that, that journey and for an incredibly thought-provoking uh, piece of work, I think, that you reported, where you really asked the question of what is minimal life and then set out to actually show what it could be. Um, but then I think when you end with your minimal life, it raises still an enormous number of questions that um, we are still trying to, uh, trying to ask there. Uh, um, I would say we have questions um, in the um, audience and on the YouTube channel. Um, there's one question that says, well, has your 83 year old postdoc shared with you the secret of keeping a passion uh, for science for so long? I don't know <laughs> where that question came from, but. <laughs> Ham Smith is a physician by training. And uh, so, so Ham Smith, the, the 93 who retired last year, his secret was he was a hardcore political liberal and he would go home every day at lunch and watch Fox News because he said it made him so angry, his blood pressure got up and he could go back and work in the afternoon. Uh, Clyde Hutchison, I, I, I don't know Clyde, I don't know what his <laughs> secret is, but he still works at the bench every day and you know he, he is just an amazing scientist. I am so lucky to work with these guys. 
I, I, I had another thinking. question myself, actually, when I um, was looking at your synthetic cell and you say, well, I, I now have my synthetic genome. And then you, you, you said you created this synthetic cell when you transplanted it. Um, but in a way, you still need a cell to build a cell. And so as a chemist, um, uh, I would say if it's a synthetic cell, you would like to build it up really from its components. So, and of course, this is a topic that we have discussed extensively over the years. Um, but what do you think is your, um, your hope for building a synthetic cell truly from its components rather than having it built by another cell? Well, so as, as you well know, Wilhelm, because you're part of my collaboration to do this, we, have, we had a, a brilliant team put together that the plan was to make a membrane envelope out of synthetic lipids that resembled a mycoplasma cell envelope. We would take a mycoplasma minimal cell genome because the bigger the genome is, it's harder to handle. And then we would take the cytoplasm, the stuff inside a mycoplasma capricolum cell, the, the cell that we transplant into in our transplantation process. So we're gonna take the, the cytoplasm, the guts from inside a bacterial cell, throw that envelope away and install this in a new envelope. And all of these technologies we thought were available on the self because, shelf because people have been building, have been using the cytoplasm from E. coli and other bacteria for almost 50 years now. They can extract it from the cells and they can synthesize RNA and proteins from these cell-free in vitro extracts. And so we said, okay, we'll do this for a mycoplasma. Now, no one had ever reported doing it for a mycoplasma and Wilhelm, your team and my team and my collaborators teams have been trying for three years now to make this work in a mycoplasma and we haven't done it. So this has thwarted our efforts to build a cell by non-living parts that way. But we did do it sort of another way. So in the, in the method I showed you in the, the slide deck, we took a, we isolated a bacterial genome and with some chemi chemical treatments, we got it to enter a living bacterial cell so that it commandeered that cell to produce a new cell with the genotype and phenotype of the synthetic genome. But I can also kill the recipient cell. So I can treat the recipient cell with an anti-cancer drug called mitomycin C that in essence destroys the genome of the cell, the recipient cell. And so when we treat the recipient cell with mitomycin C, those cells are dead. They, they're, they're just gone. They're, they're never gonna be alive. They have no, D, no functional DNA. We put a new genome in and we get a cell. So in that sense, I think we have made a cell from non-living parts but not the way that you and I were hoping to, Wilhelm. No, I can, I can see your point, definitely. Uh, let's see, is there questions in the audience? Guys, don't be shy. Uh, well, there's quite a few, actually. Uh, Migla, you, uh, you throw the microphone. Can you get it? <laughs> Very good. Um, where do I have to? Okay, that's correct. Um, okay, so I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. Um, I've read uh, Life at the Speed of Light from Craig Venter, which was basically about this whole process. I read it mm -hmm. some time ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a few questions. Um, basically, so when you talk about genes, genes, do you mean just basically uh, like combinations of RNA that code for proteins, or is there any other way that you um, think about genes? Well, so most genes in so in DNA, there's you know a, a piece of DNA that is transcribed, copied, if you will to make RNA, which is then translated to make protein. And most genes produce protein, but there are some genes like ribosomal RNAs that are not destined to make a protein, but make structural RNAs. 
but for the most part, genes make proteins. Yes, genes, genes contain the digital information needed to produce a protein. Okay. okay. And then what I was wondering was um, on the slide, you show that compared basically the different organisms and you say you have similar genes like in all of these, uh, like in humans mm -hmm. and E. coli and whatever. Yes. Um, is that then basically talking about protein coding genes or? Yes, yes. Okay. It was only the protein coding genes. The, the ribosomal genes are extremely similar because the, all life on earth shares one feature really especially and that's ribosomes you know eukaryotic and prokaryotic ribosomes are somewhat different but still remarkably the same and so proteins show much more diversity okay um and then what i was wondering is your final question because okay. otherwise <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> i have too many questions um okay final question um um yeah um what do you say about like, so you're basically doing this reductionist approach of, of trying to understand everything, but it's taking quite a long time. Um, are there criticisms of that approach? Are there other people that think that it should be done differently? Um, I haven't seen so much criticisms. There are a lot of people trying to, there, there's a great deal of diversity in the way people are doing, doing biological research. So in the Netherlands, for, for instance, there is a consortium of scientists who are in essence trying to build a synthetic living cell that will much more closely resemble E. coli than it does my organism. And so they're trying to build a, a bacterium that is much more complicated than mine, but you know, they're using some of the technologies we've developed. They're using some things that they've developed. They haven't gotten there yet. There are a lot of people who are still trying to whittle away at this question of what life really is. Egli, if you want to throw it to the next person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for an amazing talk. Uh, it was really inspiring. I was actually wondering, because when you're stripping down the genome, how much you influence the evolution, the mutation, right? Can synthetic cell um, mutate? The synthetic cell can mutate. And then actually how um, fast compared to the native strain? So mycoplasmas are not primitive bacteria. Mm -hmm. Mycoplasmas evolved from normal bacteria, but they live in such stable environments, say a respiratory system for a, a goat or a human or a urogenital tract, that they were able to throw away most of their genes. And among the genes they throw, have thrown away are some of the genes involved in DNA repair. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at phylogenetic trees that show the rates of bacterial evolution, what you see is that mycoplasmas are evolving much faster than everything else. Now, we have done experiments with our organism where we sequence the genome and then we take 10, in 10 separate tubes, we put that organism in, in 10 separate tubes of growth media and process these. And, and every day we grow them, we then pre transfer them to a new tube. And so mm -hmm. we have grown the cells for basically thousands of generations. And then we would sequence the genomes and we see that the cells are still evolving at a high rate. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, the cells end up growing about 15% faster. Okay. And where, whereas you saw lots of mutations spread all over the genome, there were about 12 mutations that were common to all 10 of the clones. Mm -hmm. And most of those were either in transport proteins in primary amino acid sequence or in the regulatory regions governing how much of the protein is made. Mm -hmm. I think I have actually a second question. How long were those filaments that actually you show in the video of this uh, second strain that you create in the microfluidic chamber? I'm asking, asking because actually maybe you consider to get the Guinness, Guinness World Record in getting actually the longest bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, we might have achieved that, but it's hard to see because the chamber fills up. The mm -hmm. beauty of the chamber. So I think if you have these cells in a, you know, a 10 milliliter tube, the fluid movement will tear the cells apart, mm -hmm. shear forces. And, and because the, the minimal cell makes a colony that looks just like the, the, its, its parent, which mm -hmm. surprises us. But in these microfluidic chambers, there are no fluid shear forces. So my guess is we are making cells that may be hundreds of microns long. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes. There's a question down, down, down there. Sure. Okay, right at the front. <laughs> so one of the things I was wondering is what do you think it would mean for biology in general and what implications would it have if you managed to map all the missing genes? Well, okay. So right now, as I said, we have 93 genes that we don't know what they do. And most of these are conserved all the way across biology. So people have been researching biology you know, for way more than a hundred years. But what if we were to find that some of these, one or more of these genes of unknown function do things that are necessary for all cells to survive that we as biologists are completely oblivious to? Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, you know, that's, that's one of the promises of this work. It may not happen. It may be that these are proteins that look almost like proteins that we know what they do, but they have evolved so far that are, they are different. And then also note that even in E. coli, which people would arguably say is the most studied organism on earth. So it has, you know, if our cell has 93 genes, we don't know what they do. E. coli has about 1,500 that they don't really know what they do. And every organism on Earth has lots more genes that we don't know what they do than our organism does. Ours is just the simplest. And, and, and you might be able to make another organism that was quite different from ours, but still had sort of the same number of genes. And our bet is it would still have to do all of the same functions that our cell does. Um, there's a question in the uh, chat that maybe is uh, relevant to this discussion. Uh, Rul Mask asks, uh, evolution probably adapted and turned, uh, turned some at first non-essential genes into essential genes. Uh, and if you follow this line of thought, do you think that smaller synthetic genomes can be created using a bottom-up approach? I think so. So we ended up leaving about 30 non-essential genes in our cell. And this was often because the genes were co-expressed with other proteins in a linear operon. And we were afraid that removing one gene might mess up the expression of another. And, and we know we, we did this some to remarkable consequences, but um, even in these simple mycoplasmas, there are what are called synthetic lethals. And so, for instance, if you have two synthetic lethals or when you have two genes who encode an essential function, both of those individually can be deleted. Now, as we started taking out genes, we realized that in some cases we may have removed both elements of a synthetic lethal and so we, we first made a genome that was uh, smaller and it didn't survive, but then we started putting pieces back in and eventually got the genome that works. Hopefully this answers your question. Uh, maybe I had a follow-up question on that. It's coming from the, uh, the chat as well, where Thais N says, thanks for a great talk. Uh, besides the presence or absence of essential genes, what do you think is the impact of transcription and translation regulation for a working minimal cell. And he says, could a gene be removed if another gene was expressed more efficiently? And maybe related to that, I was thinking in your minimal genome, you have the 
sort of eight or so different blocks of genes where the order of those blocks is actually also important. You can't just randomly shuffle them around. So, and so maybe is there a, a, an element of different genes actually compensating for one another in your minimal genome? The assumption about mycoplasmas is they are so simple that just everything is on all the time. Now, that was 15 years ago. Now we realize that there is sophisticated regulation of protein expression. And you have some proteins that are 10,000 copies per cell and other proteins that might be one copy per cell. And so we assume that we should be, you know, that, that this, it, it was thought though that we still may be able to reorganize the genome like an engineer would. So to put all of the glycolysis genes in one section of the genome and all the transport genes in another. And so the first experiment we did with this, we took the, 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 the genome is divided into eight pieces. We took one piece and reorganized it based on function. And then we put that back into a cell that was seven eighths normal and one eighth reorganized and the cell grew normally, completely normally. Everything was great. And so we said, aha, we're ready to go ahead and do the other seven segments. And lo and behold, not one of the other reorganized segments worked. So what that says is that I think context and organization in the genome probably really does matter. And we have been as much as my manpower will enable me, we've been exploring this some. You know, you and I, Wilhelm, we've got a problem that we think there is a ribonuclease uh, encoding protein somewhere in the genome. We would dearly love to get rid of this if it's possible and see if we can do that or to cut its expression or to be able to control its expression inducibly with some drug. So there, there are so many experiments to do and my lab is working on this as well as, as other labs. Let's see, is there another question? There are two questions. Uh, um, yeah, you said that there, there are still like 93 genes that are not yet mapped. And I was wondering what is the process and what are the difficulties with um, discovering the functions of that non-mapped gene, basically? So these are divided into two categories and they're roughly equal. So 46 of those genes, uh, this was my count last night, uh, 46 of them are of generic function. So I know that a gene encodes a transporter protein. I don't know what it transports, but I know it encodes a transporter protein. So I could express this protein by itself and then see what molecules it binds to, to say, ah, this protein 474, it binds to riboflavin or it binds to oligopeptides or something. Now that's one example, um, but, and you know, you know that another protein looks to be a hydrolase. So it's going to digest uh, phosphate bonds. And um, sorry, uh, okay, let me put this away. But um, it is, and, and so there it's possible to do, you know the biochemical experiments you need to figure out what the protein does. But for 47 of the genes, where we've got no idea what they do, this is a lot harder because you don't know where to start. And what we have done, so Jörg Stulke at Gottingen University, we sent him some of the minimal cell and he's doing what's called an interact, a protein interactome study where he takes the cells and he uses a chemical that cross links proteins that are touching each other basically. And then he figures out what proteins every protein is is adjacent to or interacting with. 
And so if you know what proteins a protein of unknown function interacts with, that gives you a clue as to what it might be doing. Doesn't tell you, but it gives you a place to start. More, and then another thing, there was, so there have been algorithms written by protein scientists, x-ray crystallographers for decades now to try to predict protein, precise protein structure and function from the primary amino acid sequence. And there's a, a worldwide contest every year where they publish primary amino acid sequences and then without any knowledge about what the protein does. And the scientists are supposed to then figure out what the protein looks like and hopefully what it does. And these, these contests, so uh, you know, this was academics group, groups doing this, but Microsoft has now entered this and they developed this alpha fold software that is apparently radically better than anything anyone else has ever had. And a group at the University of Washington led by David Baker made a much more user-friendly version of it called Rosetta Fold, uh, as in the Rosetta Stone, where you know, the idea is that you can take a primary sequence and it may be able to tell us, give us a better idea of what the function of a protein is. Um, but traditionally, you know, the way you figured out what a protein did is it was one protein, one graduate student, one graduate student career, you get a PhD and you know what the protein does. That seems like a, you know, I don't have the manpower to do this, but this is the way the world works. These are hard problems. I think uh, considering time, I, I think we are going to wrap it up uh, here. There were questions in the audience and in the chat, but I think uh, um, there's plenty of uh, time for discussion. We will retire to the yard as it is called, so we can go there and discuss further. Um, John, we would like to thank you for a fantastic and uh, thought-inspiring presentation. You set out on a quest to uh, make minimal life with the idea that we want to understand life. And I think from the questions and the answers, it's quite clear that we have minimal life, but our understanding is certainly uh, lacking in bits and pieces. So there's plenty of work for all of us to do. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I hope we'll be in touch soon uh, about our project uh, where we uh, struggle to construct that mycoplasma from the bottom up. But for now, uh, uh, thank you again for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you for, for lovely questions. And I hope to visit your university, your city someday in the near future. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. <laughs>